Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Don Bennett, the founder of Don Bennett Drum Studio and the current owner-operator of Don Bennett's Drum Vault. Don, welcome to the show. Bart, thank you for having me. Sure. This is, uh, you've been on my list for quite some time. Um, You have, I mean, your collection is just unbelievable. I, I guess we can put it as you are a collector of very famous drum sets. I mean, celebrity drums, if you will. These are like the Buddy Rich drum sets. These are the Ringo drum sets. These are just like the the amazing drums that everyone drools over. Thank you. Yeah. It's it has been uh, it's been really fun and really rewarding uh, doing this. I don't know how I ever really ended up here, but uh, yeah. Yeah. It's been a blast. Well, I assume before this, you were a collector of drums, just like, you know, like anyone else who collects drums, but this is next level stuff. So I'd love to know maybe, and you could even do it by like series of, I got this, then I got this, then I got this. How did you get into this? What were some early milestones that really <laughs> kicked this thing off? Um, yeah. Well, I would say this, like just about anything, started with a extreme interest in this kind of thing. Like, uh, so, you know, I was just very interested in what drums my, uh, my favorite drummers used. Yeah. And so, you know, as some people might just hear the music and that's good enough, but you know, like a lot of geeks, you know, it was, I was really curious about, you know, what really everybody in the whole band was was playing. And um, like I'm sure a lot of people could relate to, I would, you know, going to a concert and getting there hours ahead of time and just looking at the empty stage was thrilling for me. And, yeah. you know, checking out the drum set and what kind of amps and microphones and all that kind of stuff. That was you know, I didn't have any problem hanging around for three hours before the show because, yeah. um, you know, that was a sh- show in itself. And uh, you know, I think if you talk to uh, a lot of geeks, they can relate to that um, very much. Sure. So that's it just started really with a very genuine interest and in, in finding that kind of stuff just super, super cool. Um if there was a pivotal moment, it would have been at a T-Rex concert when I was probably in about ninth grade. That would have been early 70s. And uh, I caught a drumstick that the drummer uh, tossed out, Bill Legend. Hmm. And, yeah, you know, I guess anybody would think that was cool. Of but, you know, I was just like mesmerized with it. It was like, here's the stick that just propelled this entire show that I just watched that was yeah. just mind-blowing. I mean, you know, so there was a lot of significance to me that in that drumstick, you know. I'm sure a lot of people, that would have been, hey, here's a cool souvenir from that show, and life goes on. For me, it was just like, you know, it was like a gift that dropped out of heaven to me. <laughs> really? Changed your life? Well, you know, it was just like, it was just, I, well, you know, I guess it did change my life. Yeah, I guess it, it did. Yeah. But it was, it was very, very significant to me. And from there, you know, I was all, like I said, I'd always been interested in this kind of stuff. And it went on from there. And so once I had, uh, opened a drum shop and I was starting to, you know, deal in lots more drums. Um, I, I think the first famous drummer I ever encountered was Kenny Aronoff, who at the Mm. time played with John Mellencamp, who has since become one of my closest friends. Um, But we were, you know, he was looking for something and, and we ended up, trading 
uh, some drums. And so, you know, instead of paying for it, he gave me, um, you know, instead of trade or instead of buying the drum that he was looking for, he had some drums of his that he wasn't using anymore. And we swapped and, and for me, it was like, oh my God, I know this is a snare drum that Kenny Aronoff used on all these John Mellencamp records. Yeah. And it was like, this is amazing. Yeah. And so, um, not, you know, not only was he one of my favorite drummers, but this is his drum. So again, it was, there's a lot of significance to, uh, to that drum, uh, for me. Yeah. God, there's, there's something I'm right there with you where there's something just so special about that piece of gear that it's just, it has its own history and its own life. And, uh, I had my brother played in a band with a guy who, I don't know if this was actually the truth. It looked like it, but he, he had a, a DW snare and you can probably verify better than anyone else. It was, it was apparently, um, I think Joey Kramer used it in when he was, it was from Wayne's world Two when Aerosmith uh, okay. played in the movie is what the claim was. So I don't know if that was true. Um, I think it was a DW. I can't exactly remember, but, um, Anyway, here just for me seeing that it was like that's unbelievable <laughs> that drum was there. I mean, it's so cool. Oh yeah, I mean, and see that's kind of where you know you fall on one side of the line. I mean, to somebody would say, "Oh, neat, that's a drum." Oh, I was in that movie. Yeah. Nice. And to someone else like yourself or to me, it's like, "Oh my god, that's." <laughs> the drum that was in that scene and he it yeah so it's yeah. just uh, a lot of significance that you attach to it and you know at first i thought that i was the only person who really cared about that kind of stuff but then as things go on and you have more relationships and stuff see there's a lot of people that uh find this stuff really interesting yeah absolutely a lot of which we'll get, we'll talk about this later, but uh, a lot of like, and, and I've found this out personally, is that a lot of the collecting of this is from other drummers who idolize these guys, who idolize the drum sets of famous drummers who have come before them, um, which that's a whole part of the conversation we'll have. But I, your collection has just... I mean, it is just blown up, obviously, from get, catching a drumstick when you were in ninth grade. Um, so, like, things have things have gotten serious. So, mate, what are some of your favorites? I mean, you, you would probably have too many to name every single thing. But, like, like right now, let's say in your collection, what's some of your, you know, the really, really cool stuff? And I'm, I'm on your website. And let me, let me mention this, too. People can go to donbennett.com, D-O-N-N-B-E-N-N-E-N-E tt.com and see everything and um and it's all there so yeah what's some really cool stuff you have going on right now let's see um i get asked that a lot you know it's like saying you know what's your favorite song yeah uh, <laughs> and it changes all the time sure. but i know what would have to always be up there at the top of the uh, of the list would be a symbol, a China symbol, a UFIP, a China symbol that Charlie Watts gave me. Oh, yeah. Um, that's awesome. You know, that's, I mean, yeah, talk about cool. Um, that's pretty darn that's cool. That's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I think the, uh, I have a Ringo Starr uh, Black Oyster Pearl Ludwig 1963 drum set wow. you know, that was not Ringo's set, but it is literally 100% exactly identical to Ringo's first Beatles set. Mm. And so, I mean, that's pretty cool yeah, that's in and history. of itself. But for me, what really got me into collecting drums in the first place was trying to find a a Beatles set. You know, I thought I always thought the Beatles and Ringo were really cool. And I thought it'd be so cool to have a a set um just like Ringo's. Um, but 
um, I never knew all the specific details, you know, the, of uh, what was unique about Ringo's set. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that led to all kinds of pouring over pictures. And, you know, but back then it was, you know, magazines and books and just talking to other drum geeks. Yeah. Um, but uh, so this is a set I just got about a year ago. And, you know, in the course of, hunting for a Ringo set, man, I've had, uh, I couldn't tell you, I've probably had 30 or 40 of them, uh, in my life and they've come and gone. And every, every time I sell one, I think, well, I'll sell this one to get a better one. And then hopefully a better one shows up. But this, this one really, you probably couldn't get any better. Yeah. It's, uh, it's made within a couple of months of, of when Ringo's first set was made, um, it has the right snare. I mean, the I mean, I could get into the whole boring story, but there is the snare that Ringo used with the Beatles uh, is a Ludwig Black o Oyster Jazz Festival, yeah. uh, which they've made you know thousands of. But the particular one he used uh, in the particular configuration that he used is extremely rare there's only like a small handful maybe 10 of those known in the hmm. world um, and uh this set has has one of those snares and, Gosh, um, wow. so anyway it's it's a uh, as far as a, a ringo star collectible drum set goes there's many many people who are trying to get a Ringo Starr drum set. And yeah. this is in my entire life in what 40 some years of searching for one of those is hands down the, uh, the best one I've yeah. ever seen. And I, I don't see how it could get any better. So that would definitely have to be up there. Um, yeah. You know. yeah. There's that's Gary Astrid has been on the show who I'm sure you know very well. And uh, yes, the description, his his talking about you know the on stage ones, and I forget that it was the owner of a football team. I think I forget who actually is buying up Colts, some of that stuff. Baltimore Colts. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god! And the amount of money that is going into that is just it's it's astronomical. Um, yes. Unbelievable. Um, <laughs> and yeah, Gary. I mean, I won't bore you with all the specific details, and he probably talked about it. But yeah, Gary Gary is a guy who sort of has brought all of this information, all these details to light. He's the one who did the deep research and just even made people aware of the, the specific little details that were on Ringo sets that, yeah. that make them very unique. Yeah. Basically, you know, in very short is, you know, so Ringo got his drums right before they were on the Ed Sullivan show. Mm. And once they were on the Ed Sullivan show, then Beatlemania happened and yeah. Ludwig went from, you know, I think their, their orders multiplied by six overnight. Mm -hmm. And so they started making black oyster drums, like, you know, by the hundreds, thousands. But by the time Beatlemania had hit, they had changed the configuration of that snare so that all those drums, the thousands of those Black Oyster drums they were making after Beatlemania hit, after they were on the Ed Sullivan show, they are all a little bit different from Ringo's uh, actual snare. So that's why that particular mm. drum is uh, so rare. God, so like, yeah. I know we we've the the discussion of Ringo. There's been a fair amount on the show where where that that day after the Ed Sullivan show, where I think B three was talking about it on here, where he they were getting calls saying, "I want a I want a Ringo kit," and the people on the other end of the phone were going, "What's a Ringo kit?" Like they yeah. didn't know the the operators didn't <laughs> right didn't know yet. Man, so looking just there's so much, but just looking at your current inventory on on your website, I mean, you have Joey Kramer's. Aerosmith set from 2003. There's a uh, top hat and cane kit. There is. There's three top hat and cane sets. 
so those are some of the rarest drums in the world, and you have three of them. <laughs> I mean, that kind of blows my mind. Uh, oh, if, you, if, you, if, if you want to really take it to the next level, um, I think I've had eight of those sets. Um, oh, and- my God. All right. So pause there. Let me ask you. So let's, let's use the Top Hat and Cane you know, as an example, and you don't need to give away your, your secrets here, but like, are these where people are coming to you because you're, you're on on a grand, grand, grand level. You're like the guy who puts an ad in the paper and says, I buy drums or on Craigslist looking for drums. Obviously you're that times a million, but are people typically coming to you with, let's say top hat and cane kits or are, okay. Um, now, here's where it gets very interesting. I, I've i never, like, sought out a top hat and cane set. Uh, they have all come to me. And why? You tell me. I wish I... It's like uh, I think we were talking about before we started. I don't get how this works, but I know it does work, and I don't question it, but um, I don't... Yeah, I... I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, I, I have a fairly high profile and I've been doing this for, yikes, about 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but just, I mean, the way stuff comes out of the woodwork and lands in my lap or just, through, I mean, I, there's probably hundreds of stories I could tell you of just the bizarre set of uh, circumstances that lead some person out there to me there and and ends up with me acquiring some amazing drum. I mean, it just happens over and over and over. And man, I really wish there was a secret or a formula or a, but there yeah. isn't. And it just, it just keeps happening. Uh, and I call it drum yeah. karma. Um, oh, totally. Um, but certainly, I mean, you know, there's some obvious logical stuff that, you know, I do have, I've been doing it for a long time and I do have a certain high profile Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, on, I guess if there's anything that I would say is just like, I always try and treat people fairly and Mm -hmm. I, definitely, and I've never screwed anybody over and I think in general, I've got a a good reputation as an honest person and that, that, you know, I will, I will conduct myself fairly and, uh, you know, so that, that goes a long way. I mean, uh, uh, this kind of business requires a lot of trust. And if people feel like they can trust you, then I think uh, if, you know, I mean, if, if, so if there's any secret, or formula, I guess that would be it. Just, uh, uh, yeah. you know, just being honest with people. Well, uh, you know, honesty is the best policy is kind of, no, a, there, the old... there, there is a reason that that is an expression because <laughs> yeah. it has, it has proven itself, uh, you know, for generations. Uh, Definitely. And it's, it is, uh, that's very true. Now, are, do you find yourself, I guess this is a two part question. Uh, part one being, are you yourself, and I'll ask both and we can go into it. Part one being, are you yourself kind of a history nerd with all of this being, do you know the whole background? I'm assuming it, yes, on like the top hat and cane, you could probably tell us everything about it. And then part two is how did I want to lead into how do you authenticate these drum sets to make sure they're real? And I feel like they're kind of, you know, they kind of go hand in hand a little bit. So yeah. question one, are um, you, are you a big history nerd? Um, not as much as you would think. Yes, I am. And I, I do find it fascinating, but, um, yeah, you know, there are people who are much more knowledgeable about this stuff than I am. And, uh, I guess I can only commit so much stuff to, to memory. It is fun. It is, I mean, fortunately, you know, Tracing down the history of something is a lot of fun to me. And, yeah. you know, because I end up spending a lot of time doing that. Um, 
yeah, my history nerd, not really. I mean, I think I'm, compa- you know, I'm really my, I'm compelled to trace the history because uh, it's necessary. Sure. Uh, yeah. And, but, you know, there's, I mean, believe me, there are people who know all the nuts and bolts uh, yeah, far, absolutely. far, far better than I do. I think I've sort of fallen into that. I, I am a big history nerd and obviously I love this and I do this show, but there's times where I'll from 35 episodes ago, I'll forget something completely. And um, I think there's specialists in every category, obviously where, where a guy like you who has so many different uh, things going on, but I'm sure you're friends with lots of people, obviously who can, who can help you and say, Oh, that, yes. um, you know, dampening system is wrong on that Tom or something like that. Um, uh, correct. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, um, before the internet tracing history on, on a drum or, or, you know, whatever, um, you know, that usually involved a lot of phone calls. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what, I would do. I mean, I guess, let's see, when did I start this? I mean, yeah, about 40 years ago. So I'm going to start, I mean, <laughs> there were phone calls and literally letters, which seems so archaic now. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how that, you know, would happen. And, and I mean, just tracing down somebody's address or somebody's phone number, um, you know, that can be a, uh, a project in and of itself. Of course, but, sure. So, so doing the kind of detective work like that um, was always just kind of fun. And hey, you know, in the in the process, I get to have a phone call with somebody like Hal Blaine or uh, yeah. or you know whomever. I mean, that's that's pretty fun for me. Well, uh, y- you literally read my mind because I'm on the site now looking at Hal Blaine's 1980s Pearl set. All right, so on to the authentication side of things. I'm assuming that, like, if you're playing, and obviously Hal Blaine has passed away, but if you're playing, like you said earlier, Kenny Aronoff, um, you, you get some drums in f- that are Kenny Aronoff's drums. If he didn't give them to you, obviously that's kind of an authentication right there. How do you go about authenticating something like that? Do you try and get a hold of Kenny? Do you call him personally and ask, are these your drums? You know, um, all of the above, and I just sort of start with what I what I know and kind of go from there. Um, yeah. Now, now I've sort of developed a network of friends over many years that, I mean, pretty much any drummer you could think of, I know somebody who knows them. Um, or can, or can corn knows their sister or knows how yeah. to get a hold of them. Sure. Um, and again, before, you know, pre-internet, you know, that was a lot more complicated. Um, I mean, you know, digging around on the internet, I mean, a lot of people are very accessible. I mean, you can go to Facebook and boom, there's the guy's Facebook. Yeah, um, really. Um, but, uh, yeah. So I think many years of lots of relationships, uh, have, uh, served me well. So pretty much find anybody then again, fortunately from having gone, just making it a priority to treat people fairly and nicely. Yep. You know, once I do contact somebody, chances are they may know who I am. And mm-hmm. if either either they'll know that I'm legit or with a, a little poking around on their end, they'll find out that I'm legit and, yeah. that, and that I'm going to treat them fairly. Now, have obviously... Honesty is your kind of, you know, number one. That's not the case for everyone else in the world, as we all know. Have you had any instances where you get something or you come across something and it turns out it isn't what 
they said it is. I'm sure in your 40 years, you have to come across some some fakes or something like that. H- any experiences like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll give you two examples. One, we were just talking about that Ringo snare, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so recently I had a guy call me who uh, said that he had two of those snare drums. And so, you know, he, he wanted to sell them and I was interested in buying them, but they're a lot of money. And so I asked if he would send them to me on spec and, Mm. and which he was glad to do. He sent them and they were counterfeits. I mean, Uh he, uh, somebody, uh, whether it was that person or someone before him, had gone to a tremendous amount of work and done a really good job of making a counterfeit snare drum. Wow. Um, you know, there's a lot of, let's put it this way, there's a lot of drums that people have altered or something like that. Yeah. Pretty, pretty easy to uh, to tell. I mean, really like in just in seconds usually you can you know knowing what to look for you can tell and see if it's legit or not in this situation um i mean these are drums that are conceivably worth twenty thousand dollars each yeah exactly Um, somebody had gone to a great lengths to do a really good job of counterfeiting them and i mean i i was literally it i had to get out like a magnifying glass um, and really get into it to see that, I mean, they were just fate and Jeez. being trying to pass off as the real thing, which, you know, when, when a snare drum is worth, you know, maybe four or five, 600 bucks, you know, it's probably not worth somebody's time to no. go to, uh, doing the work to, uh, to, you know, try and counterfeit something like that. When it's potentially worth twenty grand, yeah, then you know, then somebody's going to be motivated to uh, to create a a drum that uh, that they can pass off as a real thing. It mm. it's been happening in uh, the guitar world for decades, um, but it's just now that drums are sort of getting up into that value range where you know it's it's worth somebody's time. God, I so I'd love to like. We'd almost have to like, you know, I feel like if I was shooting video, he'd be all blacked out and I have to modify his voice, but talk to the guy who's doing this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, oh, like an expose. You um, know, and and so where I left it off with him was I sent him back and I said, I cannot with 100% confidence verify that these are authentic. Uh, okay. And here's the reasons. And. Um, you know, I sent them back and, you know, it wasn't up to me to call him a counterfeiter because, you know, it could have, could have been done by he might have the person it. before him or yeah. whatever. But, you know, that would, I, I, I told him and explained him the reasons. And, mm. uh, so, yeah, that's taking the high road instead of saying, Hey, by the way, I'm calling the police. You're, you're in trouble. You know, that's, that's, Hey, you kind of washed your hands of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's the drum collecting world is small place. It's a small circle and, and word of that will get around and it's getting around right now as we talk, (laughs) we're putting it out there. Now I was going to give you a second half of that answer. So in the, uh, celebrity drum world, yeah, there's items that somebody says uh, was owned or used by somebody famous. And then that's where I do my homework. And yeah, there, I mean, some you have to, uh, you just have to uh, give it the benefit of the doubt that if you do the homework, that you can assume the person trying to, to sell it just you can assume maybe they didn't do their homework and they don't know any better. And, yeah. you know, hey, they, you know, they get a, a, a drum and it's in a case that says Gene Krupa on it. Um, they uh, yep. they put two and together and assume that 
that was Gene Krupa's drum. Um, well, you know, so uh, I just I, I wouldn't make a judgment other than that you know I'm I'm not convinced that it is uh, that it is real. But that yeah, that's happened. Now there have been other ones where people have tried to pass a drum off as being owned by somebody famous that you know it was clear that this wasn't true and you know they tried to sell it to somebody else who caught the same mistake and told them no this isn't true and now they're trying to me so yeah, yeah that that uh that happens too i do uh i do you know like i said i have a large network of people who who are in the know on this stuff, be it drum techs, be it people uh, in the drum, you know, the manufacturing uh, uh, industry, uh, the other players. Um, you know, I just, I usually have a way to find some way to circle back and and authenticate something. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I... Maybe it's just, you know, on the Facebook groups and stuff, but it seems like, uh, I'm assuming Buddy as well, but it seems like there's a lot, Gene Krupa, there seems to be a lot of like, this was Gene's drums, this was Gene's drum, this was Buddy's drums, this was Buddy's snare. It seems like there's a lot of, maybe it's because they're just so famous and synonymous with drums. It just seems like there's a lot of those. And then you get the guys like Brooks Tegler, who are, you, you sick Brooks on it, and then he shuts it down <laughs> real <laughs> yes, quick. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's also like you get on Facebook, and I I hate to say, it, but there's a lot of self-proclaimed experts who yeah. will chime in very confidently, one way or the other, um, you know, pro or con. And then, unfortunately, people see that and they take that as a gospel. Um, they say, "Well, you know, this guy says that it's fake." Well, you know, yeah. a lot of times. It doesn't matter because that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, that sort of opens up a whole nother uh, can of worms in online chatter that sort of becomes truth to a lot of people. I feel like a lot of people, that's one thing that I've learned from from doing this whole process of starting the show is there's there's a lot of experts who might not be the correct expert, if that makes sense. There, there's a lot of people who... Um, who are very, very knowledgeable, but they might both like literally take it to their grave that they are correct. And they are, they have polar opposite beliefs about one thing. It's just, you don't know really who to believe sometimes, you know? And I think, I think anybody, you know, with, with a little bit of sense can sort of filter through what's, what kind of chatter is legit and what's not. But, you know, there's just those guys sure. who just say stuff online. I mean, everybody's seen it. They, they just put it out there as, you know, the God-given truth that <laughs> yeah. this is what it is. And they don't know. It's just their opinion or what they think or what yes. what somebody told them or, or what they thought. Um, anyway, so, yeah, yeah uh, I just kind of try to steer clear of that kind of stuff and get as close to the source uh, as possible. And, you know, sure. I have the luxury of many years uh, experience, like you're saying, and lots of, of relationships where I can, I can usually get extremely close to the source or as close as you can, as close as you can get. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and you'll see, you'll, if you look at my, uh, the listings, I'll, I'll describe what the connection is. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes I, I don't always go into the complete detail in the actual listing, but, you know, if somebody, if somebody, uh, you know, wants to know more about something, uh, you know, I, I can document and I do document the whole sort of research trail and, you know, that, that all goes into, quite frankly, in when I value something, I put a price on it. Um, you know, the, uh, the quality of the, uh, the, the trail, uh, yeah, is sure. a, plays a big part in, uh, what something's worth. Well, it's like when you buy a car, 
And um, someone's yeah, documented, yeah. they have all their oil changes listed. It's like, oh, okay, well, this seems more legit than any other car. Um, but what you just said has segued perfectly into my next question, where these are valuable drums. I mean, I'm looking, I mean, obviously, I think they're priced correctly. You know the market better than anyone else. But I mean, I'm looking at the Buddy Rich 1968 Slingerland drum set for $32,995. So $33,000 for that. Um, and, you know, they range from, you know, under a thousand up to a hundred thousand. Like I would love to know. So, so this isn't like a thing where, um, someone's just going out and buying this on a whim. You're not buying John Densmore's, uh, the, the kit he played, um, for $10,000 just because you have a little bit of extra money. So I'd love to know about, um, who are like, are your, is your customer base typically high level collectors? Are they other, you know, famous drummers? Or, I mean, you have to have a little bit of, a little bit of money mm-hmm. to be able to buy these things. All of the above. Yeah, they are. I mean, they are expensive. And so, uh, you know, for the most part, nobody who's just sort of like has a casual interest in something like that is going to spend that kind of money yeah. um, unless they're really into it, right? Sure. So so most of the people I deal with it are really into it. And um, so they, okay, there are collectors. And, you know, that the, uh, the collector world has, has grown uh, – a lot. I mean, in, in as long as I've been doing it, the a number of people and the number of interest, a number or, and the amount of interest has has just increased exponentially. Yeah. Um, and the uh, you know just like we we're talking about Gary Astridge, the uh, the information about stuff has uh, and research has increased dramatically, and that also drives up the value of something you know once 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 people understand the rarity of something based on someone's research then yeah. thus the value goes up and then you know the value goes up so does the interest you know people want that more sure uh, so yeah um i quite frankly i'm very amazed that there are you know there are a lot of people uh who are willing to pay you know you know very real money for uh well documented uh historical items like this you know a, a lot of people told me early on you're crazy you know nobody's nobody's going to spend $40,000 on a drum set i don't care who played it <laughs> um and you know i i heard that many 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 times i still do but um you know, uh, well, one of my, I, I put it, I rarely respond to, uh, people who make comments like that. Yeah. You know, I see them on Facebook. Sure. I, I, I just don't even respond to them. I just don't worry about it. But, uh, occasionally I will dive in with my favorite comment. And when somebody says, you'll never sell it for that much, or you're crazy. <laughs> um, I just always love to say, well, I'll be sure to pass that on or to the guy who just bought it. <laughs> That's funny. I think it's great. And I, I truly think that like, so, so backing up to my last question too, though, would, would a lot of these guys who are maybe you're dealing with be like, we talked earlier about um, like Charlie Watts, you have a great relationship with him and, and I can speak my, my, you know, encounter with him, which was just amazing. We were talking about how you've got this amazing relationship. You are a, you're his guy. I mean, you're his one of his drum dealers. I mean, that's he, he is just the top of the mountain. I mean, so you've got these relationships with with great guys like that. Um. Yes, and I a day does not go by that I don't consider myself uh, extremely fortunate when uh, for those relationships. Um, you know, I mean, in Charlie's case. Uh, besides just being like an extraordinarily enjoyable person who's just, who's just absolutely 
just thrilling just to, I mean, forget if he's a Rolling Stone or whatever. Just He's just such a, a great guy. I, I would look forward to working with somebody that nice and that great and that, uh, that uh, respectful uh, in any situation. And then, oh yeah, you tag in there that yes, he is in the Rolling Stones, who's, you know, which are my favorite band and he's my too, favorite yeah. drummer. Um, and yeah, so to have a relationship like that is just like kind of off the chart. Um, and, you know, I'm, what was it? Uh, uh, my good friend, Jeff Chonis, uh, who is Ringo's tech, he told me a long time ago after after we'd done several deals with uh, with Ringo. And he said that, uh, he said, oh, I just thought I'd tell you that. Um, I was talking with Ringo and he said, and we were, uh, and we were, we were talking about looking for something and he goes, well, why don't you just call Dawn in Seattle? And I'm like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, you're like, the, I that's mean, a, oh. for, well, put it this way. I said, Charlie was my favorite drummer, but you know how that goes. That changes with yeah, the wind. Sure. Uh, it's Ringo bringing. would be right up there with <laughs> yeah. uh, with Charlie, and depending on what day you asked me, uh, you know, it would determine what answer you got on that. Yeah, but yeah, to have Ringo saying, "Yeah, why don't you just call Don in Seattle?" The fact that Ringo Starr know who's, knows who I am, that he knows what my name is, and that he knows where you, you live. Know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think it's so cool, and I kind of feel like this. I'm like you know, I'm doing the podcast. I just feel like there's so many ways to be involved in the drum community. You don't have to be Ringo to be able to right. be, you know, such a mega inf I mean, Ringo knows you and you're, you're a guy Ringo trusts. I mean, that's, it's, there's, you just got to get yourself out there and, and find a way to, 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 um, to be involved. I mean, that's just that's, unbelievable. That's very true. You know, I think, uh, I know I, and I can probably speak for a lot of people, you know, you start this path wanting to be a rock star or a, a music star or you know jazz or whatever it is. Uh, that's that's where the path starts. I mean, sure. I doubt anybody picks up a pair of sticks, you know, with the goal of becoming a famous drum dealer. <laughs> it, <laughs> it just, you know, it, it probably doesn't happen. It certainly no. didn't happen in my uh, in my case. Sure, um, but. You know, you start on the path and and you you go and stuff happens and you, you kind of continue to follow your path and your interests and uh, and then you end up in this very nice place, which, you know, and you're saying, you know, there's a lot of different ways of being involved in the whole drum world in very satisfying and exciting ways. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of depends on just how open you are to them and, and, uh, you know, definitely being, being, being aware that you can't plan a lot of stuff. I mean, there's, there's no way I could have planned my career. I mean, I, I mean, um, two months before I decided to open my drum shop, I'd never in my life had a uh, the thought even enter my mind of opening a drum shop. Mm. You know, it's it's not something I dreamt of or aspired to. It just kind of uh, it just kind of evolved, and I certainly never had any idea at that point that I would you know that I would ever find this this mega super micro niche of the drum industry of dealing with celebrity drums and, and celebrity drummers. Um, yeah. I, you know, that was no plan. It just like practically all of a sudden I found myself uh, with that, you know, just because I was interested in that kind of stuff and, and, and uh, sort of poking around for that kind of stuff or, yeah. or and you're good at it, obviously. Uh, uh, aware of it when I did see, you know, when I did stumble onto something that, that, you know, this, this, this is a cool thing as opposed to this is just some old drum set. 
It's like, no, the fact that whomever owned this and used this, this makes it more special. Yeah, um, really. And to be, just being aware of that kind of yeah. led me here. But I, yeah, I certainly, uh, it yeah. wasn't by any plan or, uh, or, uh, you know, lifelong dream. It just kind of, I just started on the path of playing the drums and this is kind of, and I just kept following what, yeah. uh, what found was you. interesting to me. And, and here I am. Yeah. That's so cool. For people to really understand the collection and all of this, again, go to donbennett.com. But um, so, Don, I want to talk a little bit about you have on your website, and I've seen it on Not So Modern Drummer, um, the 1925 Ludwig William S. Hart Jr. Gold Snare, the Holy Grail, as it's called on here, $118,000. This is obviously a major piece of history. Um, I... I would imagine, I mean, I think most people who are somewhat knowledgeable in history realize that the swastika has a very long, 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 long history well before the Nazi party, all of that stuff. But this drum, it had has swastikas on it, but it's, it is one of the most <laughs> like unbelievable drums. What could you want to talk a little bit about that drum? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm glad you asked because that really is the whole thing I mean, is a fascinating story. Um, you know, we could probably do an entire hour just on that drum. Yeah. Um, for the people who don't know. So there is this, uh, 1920s, uh, Ludwig snare drum that was made for this guy named William Hart, who was a really famous silent movie cowboy. So, um, in talking to his family, you know, he would be like about the equivalent of a uh, Sylvester Stallone or, um, wow. you know, a, a huge box office uh, yeah. movie star cool. and yeah. kind of an eccentric. And uh, so th while it wasn't pre-Nazi party, because see, you talk about the research and history. So mm -hmm. trust me, I've done a lot. So sure. uh I think the Nazi party was founded about four years before this drum was made. Okay. But at that time, you know, it was just a small labor movement in Germany that really nobody outside of Germany uh, had ever even heard of and really was, was uh, just not significant. And, certainly had nothing to do with the Nazi party that it, it evolved into with, you know, with yeah. Hitler and the, uh, and, you know, all the atrocities and the Holocaust, uh, you know, it's way predating that. Sure. So the swastika is a symbol that's been around for, for centuries. And it's been used in many, many different cultures and meaning lots of different things. And all of them have been very positive things. It's, it's essentially a peace symbol mm -hmm. um, or in some cultures, one, uh, a, a, like almost like a good luck or a prosperity, you know, like um, not just good luck, but a, a well-wishing of, of all good things. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, that symbol got hijacked by the Nazis yep. and they did everything they did. And it's become uh, synonymous with, you know, all of the uh, ugliness that they uh, had perpetuated. Uh, so here sits this drum that uh, uh, that William Hart had chosen this symbol to decorate this beautiful drum that he gave to his then I want to say it was three-year-old son, which was a, you know, really a very beautiful gift with, with a very beautiful uh, intention, you know, that he, he wanted, he's wishing the best for his, his young son. Yeah, sure. And, and also bought the most expensive drum ever made, you know, at the time uh, to give to his three-year-old son, which I guess is just kind of like a, uh, you know, a typical movie star kind of a thing to do, you know, when you've got 
outlandish kind of money. <laughs> it's just what you do. Yeah. Um, so that drum, of course, the kid was three and he, you know, may have hit it a couple of times. Um, it got put away and, you know, he didn't take to the drums and there it sat um, in perfect condition. You know, it was just stored. And uh, OK, so meanwhile, in 1925, I believe it was when that drum was made, it was such a such a uh, a big deal that Ludwig uh, wrote an article about it in their Ludwig Drummer magazine. And it was on the cover of that. And they're talking about this beautiful drum. And and again, at the time, swastikas didn't mean anything. It was just like a, it really was like a peace sign. Yeah, uh, sure. Um, anyway, so the the stroke of luck for the whole drum history world is the fact that that drum was documented on the cover of the Ludwig Drum magazine in 1925. Uh, so there it was, and among then, um, then you know, decades pass, and drum geeks had wondered where this drum was. And Harry Kangany, a uh, one of the original vintage drum dealers, uh, just being an historian, uh, he had started years ago, I believe, it was in the nineties, trying to track this drum down or find out whatever happened to it, and wrote many letters and calls and, and came up with nothing. But he did send a letter, I, and I hope I have the dates right, but we'll, I'll go back and look, but you'll get sure. the idea. Sure. I believe it was around 1990, he sent a letter to the Hart family, who, and they never responded. Hmm. But they did get it. Somebody got that letter, and they stuck it in the case where the drum was without ever responding. 20 years later, they are moving, clearing stuff. You know, uh, this, this Hart family had, had like, you know, this guy was a, a eccentric collector. So he had massive collections of, of just all kinds of stuff. And they had, so, uh, they, they were moving they're trying to sort out all of his stuff. A massive job. Come this drum. They're trying to figure out what to do with it. Here's this letter from Harry Kangany that he wrote 20 years previous. Anyway, they respond to the letter and say, uh, 20 years after the fact. <laughs> and uh, they say, yeah, we have the drum and it's been sitting in a case for its entire life. And it's in a picture and it's in perfect condition. And, you know, you talk about a holy grail for a historian to, yeah. you can imagine Harry when he got that letter. 20 uh, and, years later. Oh my God. And he had, you know, he'd pretty much just given up on, on ever finding anything and had forgotten about it. And, you know, life had gone on. So uh, it, then as it turned out, you know, their conversation went on. Uh, he was... Uh, or they were interested in selling it. Uh, Harry, at, by then, was no longer a drum dealer, and just not really interested in doing that. We had had dealings in the past, Harry and I, and, you know, we were friends and, and had a great time dealing drums. And he said, well, you should call Don Bennett. He could, he could uh, probably, he's probably the best guy to help you with that. And here we are. So, uh, so I was given the task of trying to, uh, sell that drum Jeez. and, wow. you know, so on one hand it is this, you know, most expensive drum ever made at the time. There's probably been more expensive drums made since and it's sure. absolutely beautiful. And, uh, I mean, for people listening, it is all gold. And um, the, the whole drum is all gold, beautifully done in gold. And then uh, there are these uh, sterling silver swastikas. There's probably, I don't know, 40 of them yeah. uh, that are applied to the shell all over the drum, plus a beautifully engraved 
uh, little plaque uh, where he's, uh, uh, you know, he says he, it says he's giving it to his son with love or whatever it says. But it's just an amazing looking drum. And a pe- it re- would be the holy grail of, uh, of all drum collecting uh, and worth a tremendous amount of money. You know, however, uh, oh, by the way, it is covered with swastikas. <laughs> Uh, you know, talk about a little hot button. Yeah, um, that's the um, one thing that is. Oh, yeah. in, in oh the did world. I mention? Oh, did I mention it's covered with all forty or fifty swastikas? <laughs> yeah. But besides that, so it just ignore it. <laughs> so here's my hope is that the person who buys that uh, is going to be able to. It, it, it it'll be like the. Uh, It'll be the uh, coming full circle on that. It's basically it's 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 going to be the not letting evil. Yeah, really. it, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good overtaking evil. So yes, um, you know, evil swiped that sign and made it into an awful thing, and yeah. and this drum can turn that around or it's, or it's like, no, I'm not going to let evil take this beautiful thing and turn it into something nasty. Um, no, yeah. I mean, there's, there's buildings all over the world that have oh. like engraved, like in the, in the, the tile in like India and in Europe yeah, where yeah. there's swastikas all over. I mean, it's uh, so, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And so that is my hope that it, it you know, when you really get into the deep, motivation and what what would be really exciting to me is that that when that drum sells it will be a matter of good uh winning over evil oh, and man. yeah um, so i hope and uh, you know it's going to happen sooner or later uh uh and of course but yeah. until then there it is for the longest time i i didn't even list it on my website i just I tried to sell it to individuals, you know, by strictly by phone calls. And if somebody was interested, then I would send them a picture. It's yeah. being, you know, really handling like that, it like a hot potato. And I even wrote an article for one of the big drum magazines uh, explaining the whole history to, you know, to help people understand. Sure. Uh, and if you notice on my website, even now for the main, the, the thumbnail picture, the main picture that people see, I don't have a picture of the drum. I just have a picture exactly. of the article where, yeah. you know, if you look closely, you can see it. Um, and then if you look in the article, I go to great lengths to try and explain the history there. Um, but, you know, so many people said, you know, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. You know, that's going to get on Facebook and and, you know, you're going to start some misinformed rampage you know next thing you know you're gonna be everyone's gonna be saying you're a nazi I, and i don't think you're a nazi <laughs> i really you know do. yeah and, and it's funny you say that because eventually that's where i stopped being afraid of it and said look you know what if any if somebody would have to try really hard to try to paint me as a nazi or a uh somebody who supported that and, yeah. you know, if somebody wants, if somebody wants to create some big fuss, I, I, I can't see it getting legs and no. going crazy. I think, you know, I've, I've got enough track record that exactly. and enough people know who I am that they could see BS when uh, they see it. They recognize BS when they see it. No, they're not going to go, man, after 40 years, I never knew Don was a yeah, Nazi. I never <laughs> knew he was a Nazi. My God, he seemed like such a nice guy. Yeah. No. Wow. It's a beautiful drum. Everyone should check it out. And I think um, it's a part of history. So, yeah. And like I said, ultimately, it is going to be good triumphing over evil sooner or later. And, you know, there's. There is uh, there's a lot of ugliness out there in the world right now, yeah. and uh, if you know that that will be really gratifying to me when that happens, and I know it will happen. 
Um, I mean, hey, any drum dealer who sells a $118,000 drum, it, that's going to be very gratifying. Yeah. Um, but that will really be small potatoes compared to the fact that this will demonstrate good yeah. winning out over evil. L- removing the stigma, not giving it the power, yeah. the evil, it's, the power. It's diffuse, you know, yeah, it would be diffusing the negative power that uh, that uh, it basically stole from uh, that symbol. Absolutely. Cool. Well, Don, I think that's that's a really cool end of the episode because I've actually been curious about that drum forever. And it's it's just one of those like like you said, you you, you look at it and you go, oh, my God. But it's it's a piece of history. Um, so, yeah, everyone can check that out on the website. And, and before we wrap up, I want to tell people because I know a lot of my listeners are, are actually you know, there's a lot of big time collectors who you, I guarantee, you know, many of them and they're, they're probably people you, you deal with already and they can afford a lot of the nice drums. But for guys like me, I think it's really cool on your website, how, um, you do have a couple like, like, um, there is a t-shirt section you can get for like 150 bucks, 75 bucks, um, t-shirts that were, correct me if I'm wrong, they were basically like the band shirts that Elvin Jones and his band would wear um, and the yeah. crew, right? Yeah. Aren't those cool? They're really um, cool. Those, shir- those shirts, uh, yeah. So, and I'll, I'll keep it brief, but, you know, when Elvin passed, uh, I bought Elvin's entire uh collection of drums and it wasn't a collection it was just like what he'd acquired these yeah. are just all his drums and he never got rid of anything so he literally had an entire apartment filled floor to ceiling every room with his old drum gear so uh i mean talk about a you know a pharaoh's tomb a king tut's tomb uh, yeah. i mean that was just like i i still am selling much of that stuff and and boy that's you know through that i've came to well that's how i came to know charlie watts is he bought some Mm. of that stuff i've just got to know dozens maybe hundreds of of drummers and um famous and just other otherwise just um it's been an amazing experience um but yeah, amongst all that stuff were all these t-shirts and, and some of them are actually Elvin's actual shirts. And then other mm-hmm. ones are uh, the ones that, uh, he, uh, he had made for his band and, and he, he never had, you know, like a swag t-shirt. He never sold t-shirts like a lot of bands do now. Yeah. Like a merch booth kind of thing. Yeah. yeah so uh, the only way to get one of those shirts was either to be Elvin or to be in his band. Mm-hmm. And I'll, and I'll, I don't know if you also saw it, but it's it's worth mentioning because it's another one of these really cool finds uh, is that in a box in the last transaction I had with Elvin, with Elvin's wife, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, is there was a big case full of Elvin's personal collection of his gig posters. Cool. It's like since the 70s. So, you know. You know, he traveled all over the world, gigged all over the world, and whenever he could, he would get a uh, the, uh, a copy of the poster from uh, from whatever gigs he was doing, and we just take him and throw him in a box, and uh, that's what he wow. did. And that box got stuck in storage and forgot about. And so I've got this collection of about five hundred of his posters, and. You know, not only not only are they cool, really historical posters from, I mean, they chronicle like I don't know what would have been about about thirty years of his life, um, but yeah. you know, they're they're his personal uh, posters that you know he collected uh, hmm. out there on his travels. Uh, That's so cool. I mean, you talk about every picture telling a story. Those things, uh, you know, every one of them has uh history and boy i'll tell you just every one of them is a can of worms basically because you know in the little digging around i've done you know so i talk to a promoter and i find you know i get in touch with a promoter who who 
who was promoting that show, and then he's got a story about how Elvin treated him so nicely and, and the gig or something crazy that happened at the gig. And every one of them's got a story like that. God, and wow. Uh, so, so cool. Yeah, yeah. That's the fun stuff that I end up spending my time doing. That's what I do. Yeah. Well, and I think it's cool to say that just so like people know to go to your site and that they're not all these, you know, hopefully people can buy, you know, the Buddy Rich drum set or something like that, but you can still get a t-shirt, you know, for our, I've got all, I, I, yeah. I do have all kinds of stuff. It's not just uh, $40,000 drum sets. Um, yeah. I do, I do try to only deal in really nice stuff I, it's I, quality yeah it's not i steer clear of the project kind of stuff because really i just don't have time to do projects anymore sure uh, so um yeah so boy, yeah. it's i've just had the uh, really good fortune to be able to sort of specialize in uh, in sort of the, the the really nicest stuff um out there um, i'm very fortunate it is the nicest stuff Man, well, so everyone can go to, like I said before, Don Bennett, D O N N B E N N E T T dot com. You can see everything there and just keep up with Don. And um, man, Don, I want to just thank you for taking the time to share the amazing story about these drums and all this stuff and, and your background. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll be able to hang out at when the when the drum shows actually start back up again after all this craziness is over. I sure hope so. And I, I, I didn't realize how much I missed that stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I really look forward to that. And it's, you know, it's, it's worth mentioning also. So for, I don't know, five or six years, I was writing a column every month called uh, Time Capsules in Drum Magazine. Mm -hmm. Now they stopped publishing recently yep. and uh, Modern Drummer picked up the column and so now it's called Don Bennett's Drum Vault. And yeah. every month I do a story on some uh, some item from my collection. Um, and so, yeah, that uh, that whole column, you know, first with drum and now with Modern Drummer, that was uh, a lot of fun. And, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's that word again, keep uh, being historian. But sure. writing those, <laughs> I, you know, I, I really had to go and and do the history and get it on paper. Um, but uh, so I document the, the whole sort of process, kind of like we're doing today, the whole process yeah. on, uh, on researching uh, any one of these uh, uh, many drums that have, have come across my path. Uh, awesome. so, but yeah, oh. that's a, that'll, that's in, uh, that'll be a monthly column out in, uh, in every issue of modern drummer. That's great. Many ways to keep up with Don. Um, <laughs> so cool. Well, Don, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. And, uh, and like I said, everyone can go to johnbennett.com and check it out. So, um, Don, thank you very much. Hey, Bart, uh, again, thank you. Thank you for having me. And, uh, hey, this, this was a, uh, an afternoon well spent. I love talking about drums and, <laughs> you know, I could probably keep this going for another few hours. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. Awesome. Thank you, Don. Bart, thanks a million. All right, take care. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>